Belado Nyan Wangat, Naranik Mandi, Warren Jerry Willamick, Warren Jerry Balakut, Mundana Murup Galada Pirang, Mundana Kiripik, Mundana Bupup Nakurenik, Balalal, Bagugung Nugulik, Babikut, Big Dewey, Banyapik, Murnmutpik, Wurubik, Bad Darangogpik, Babundalal, Willamu. So what I said in my language, my language, my mother tongue is the Woiwurrung language. It's the traditional language of this city that we call Melbourne today, but the true name of this place is Nam, and it means bushland. And it's connected to our narratives of creation of place. So the beautiful river that flows through the heart of the city is called Birarung, and it means river of mist. So it's something that is really important when you're visiting to understand the first culture of this place. So what a great opportunity, because I know there's a lot of international guests here to this morning, and I'm very proud to be able to share a little snapshot of our culture. So my name's Mandy Nicholson, I'm a Wurundjeri woman, and I also have connections to the Jar Jar Wurrung and Nyurai Ilam Wurrung language groups. So they're two other First Nation language groups in Victoria. So we've got a small state of Victoria, but we've got a lot of different language groups in this small state. So there's over 38 different languages. And within those languages, there's different dialects. So over 60 languages in Victoria. So a, a little snapshot of the language of Nam of Melbourne through dance that we'll be showing you this morning. So what I said in my language is that I embrace all of my ancestors, all the trailblazers that led the way before me, uh, also, the different layers of country, there's all different spiritual layers of country and how we connect to them. And I thanked my kidup, my friends and my family, my bubup nakwarenik. So thank you again for having us this morning and I hope that you walk away with a little tiny bit of knowledge of the first culture of this place called Nam or Melbourne. So our first dance that we're going to do, we're going to do two quick dances. The first one is our Womanji Kinyarga. So Womanjika is generally described as welcome, but when you break the word up, woman means to come from somewhere. G is an instruction of being asked, and ka is purpose. So it's perfect for today. So you'll see the dancer, we've got one dancer today, Haley, and she'll be dancing with some gum leaves, and the gum leaves represent a welcome. So when you are welcomed properly by First Nations people in this part of the world, you get a smoking ceremony, so we put gum leaves on the embers of a fire to create smoke, or steam, really, and it cleanses you while you're visiting. So that's why we dance with our gum leaves. And we've got a possum skin belt on. So the girls get that belt when they go through a ceremony called murum turukuruk, or a coming of age ceremony. So this is our Womanjika Nyarka, our welcome dance. Thank you. Wurundjeri. <laughs> Warangere al naramu Warangere Warangere al naramu Warangere Warangere al naramu Bambu chu maninga Bambu with one more dance and it, it's all about our connection, our spiritual connection to the different layers of country, below country, on country, water country, wind country, sky country and star country. So this is our big nyarka, our country dance. Waranjere, waranjere, narapo, 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 narapo. 
narapo waranjere waranjere ya narapo 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 karanga karanga pe kunjula kunjula welmo welamo welmo welamo karanga karanga pe kunjula kunjula welmo welamo welmo welamo woro 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 pe kunjua kunjua nganga 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 woro 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 pe kunjua kunjua nganga 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 Mot, mot, pe kuranga, kuranga, ngolo, 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 ngolo. Mot, mot, pe kuranga, kuranga, ngolo, 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 ngolo. Pan, pan, pe kumrala, kumrala, morenda, 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 morenda. Pan, pan, pe. Yumrala, yumrala, morenda, 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 morenda. Pek, pek, chwe, yambala, yambala, ngarka, 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 ngarka. Pek, pek, chwe, yambala, yambala, ngarka, 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 ngarka. Pek, pek, kot. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome to country. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm John Grundy. I'm the general chair for ICSI 2023, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you to our, our wonderful home here in, in Melbourne and Australia. So I want to uh, also acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of the land here in Nam, Melbourne, and uh, pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. I particularly want to acknowledge the person uh, from the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders community with us today, uh, and uh, any First Nations uh, person, and pay my respects uh, to you. Uh, so we had a, um, an interesting time <laughs> the last few years. Um, in 2020 and 2021, we have, of course, had to run the conference virtually, and uh, Matt and his team did a, a really amazing job um, morphing us into a, a, a virtual and, and in-person event last year. Um, we wanted to try a mostly in-person ICSI, although we did want to acknowledge that a number of people just simply can't travel um, for a, a number of very good reasons. Uh, it turned out to be a little more challenging than expected, so most people are here in person, although we do have a number of people um, attending and presenting online. Um, it was a little unclear how some of these kind of technologies would support that, although so far it's gone okay, as far as I could tell from attending several sessions the last few days. Um, we do have 30 odd papers that will be presented um, virtually, but that means there's like 450 or so going to be presented uh, in person, and a small number have been uh, presented virtually. Um, however, I think this is still a challenge for us as a community going forward. How do we um, have these kind of really rich in-person events, but then also how do we um, support people who can't attend a network um, with us? Uh, that's my little infographic, by the way, where people are from, um, attending, mostly attending in person, as I say. Maybe that one's slightly more useful, so we've got our usual contingent from North America, a good number of Australians here, of course, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, so again, uh, for the main conference, that's, that's today, tomorrow, and Friday, we've got over 500 um, warm manner of um, activities going on. Um, we also have the student research competition and score competition, many uh, newcomer events. Uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, equity, diver diversity, and inclusion uh, events, uh, and a, a various uh, special uh, tracks and so on as well. It does mean we've got something like about um, 11 parallel things um, most, most sessions, most days. 
Um, we also have all the workshops and co-located events and anything I've got to mention. Uh, and Laurie and Max give you a little bit more detail in a moment on that. Um, particularly for newcomers, welcome. And we actually have a surprisingly large number, which is really great. So the XE community is hopefully not too cliquey and um, people will be feeling welcome. Hopefully some of you went to the, the dinner yesterday. We've got the Wednesday, by the way, I'm hoping that these rooms are still up to date. They keep changing on me every now and then, so apologies if that's slightly out of date, but check your program. Um, we've got the, the breakfast on Friday as well, and uh, any, any um, questions about um, newcomer events or activities, please feel free to talk to Benita and, and Zen Chang. Uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion, uh, quite a number of activities. Uh, the, uh, the Women Lunch, there's a couple of um, conversation cafes, uh, the LGBTQ Plus uh, Lunch, the Book Club, uh, the, um, the, the um, uh, Black, Indigenous, and People of Colour um, event. And uh, any, again, questions or feedback on this, please, to, to Ida and Josh. Uh, and a whole bunch of other activities. Again, I hope I didn't forget any there, but you know, um, there's the reception tonight, the dinner party tomorrow, uh, I've got the recruitment breakfast tomorrow morning, um, and a number of other activities as well. And also the town hall um, that'll be um, run by Tom and Ladan tonight. Please go along and give some feedback about the conference, but the, the, to, to the software engineering community leaders uh, as well. The gentle reminder, <laughs> um, there is um, the IEEE and ACM policies against discrimination, harassment, um, inclusivity, and so on, we need to follow. Um, please be respectful in speech and action, mindful of differences in culture uh, and engagement. Um, no demeaning, discriminatory, harassing behavior of speech. Um, and um, again, please, please, please do critique ideas, but never people. A little bit of information there, and if you have any concerns, um, please do report them to our, our CARES team, or our Equity, Diversity and Inclusion team. Why is that not advancing, he says. Go again. Ah, um, sustainability, so this is, this is something we're grappling with as a world, in our climate emergency, uh, but also as a conference, of course. So um, uh, Patricia and Marcel are trying to gather some information about what are, what are the most valuable things a community should be doing, so we keep that doing them, but how do we do them in more sustainable ways? So there will be a session feed, a little QR thing you'll see out after every session. Please give us some feed, but what should we keep doing as a community to maximize value, but then how do we trade that off against the costs, um, holistic costs of, of doing it going forward? And any um, questions or feedback about sustainable issues, please do talk to uh, Patricia and Marcel about that. Okay, this is the montage of the organizing team. Um, just very briefly, I won't name everybody because there's too many, but lots and lots of track chairs. So we've got over 200 technical track papers. We've got over 250 various other track papers that took a whole lot of effort to manage the reviewing process, the, the selection, the committees, and so on. And many, many uh, track chairs did that work, and I, I thank you so much. It's been just a fabulous team. And we've also got lots of people running various um, events, newcomers, students, uh, new faculty, diversity and inclusion, sustainability, etc. Um, got to get the proceedings done, got to get the schedule done, which again, with more than 500 items for three days is a mammoth task in itself. Um, we're trying to do some innovative things with the showcase, the future of software engineering, um, uh, have to manage the awards, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks so much to all those people who have been working hard to do that. I also want to thank all the organisers of the co-located events and workshops. We've got 22 workshops and I think it's actually 11 co-located events, which is an enormous effort for them. They're, they're, they're organising teams, they're reviewing, their various um, community management um, that needs to be done, all by volunteers. No, not a single person's paid for any of this work, of course. I particularly want to thank the ICSMA team, so Kate, um, Team lead, Jesse, you probably got some emails from. Emily, you probably got lots of emails from. Andrea and, and Tiffany have done sponsorship and, and event um, showcase management and so on. So they've been an amazing team to work with. It's a super difficult conference to organise, and as the general chair, their their efforts and work has, has just been um, just been totally amazing. So um, so really, totally appreciative of that. Um, again, we've got a lot of the orange shirt ones. I like the colour. Some people don't, but I do. <laughs> um, thanks so much for them. Again, giving the time. Um, lots and lots of community events being run again by volunteers and the enormous numbers of reviewers. Again, if you count up all the number of, we've got 
what, 900 and something papers of various types, and I multiply that by at least three or three point something, that's, that's an enormous amount of feedback that's being given to peers through that process. Thanks to our sponsors. Um, again, we, um, it's very expensive to run a conference, and um, we tried to actually keep the costs to, um, actually we used the 2019 numbers with a tiny amount of inflation. It turned out to be a lot less than the real inflation, and the reason we can kind of do things that we do is thanks to the generous sponsorship from many organisations. So thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, and then I also want to particularly thank the, the programme co-chairs, Laurie and Max. I've been general chair for a number of conferences over the years, but they've been really wonderful um, to work with. Done so much work and done it so well and so helpful. Christopher did all the, the budgeting stuff, but also was involved in a lot of the decision making that we, we made along the way. It was great to have someone else to bounce it and tell me when I was wrong, which was not frequently. And then Omar, who um, I asked to be web chair, but the role ended up growing into um, helping people set up their hot CRPs, their own websites, um, a lot of the program work and so on. So really, um, while he was finishing his PhD as well, some of that um, effort. So really, really appreciate um, this, this special team of people that, that help so much uh, as well. And then, thanks to you all, um, we wouldn't have a conference without um, presenters um, and, and authors of papers, so um, it's for you. We do it. Um, thanks for doing it. Keep doing it, please. Give us some feedback about what we can do better in the future, and I hope you enjoy XE. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's so great to see all these people here in person instead of in little boxes. This is awesome. So I'm Laurie Pollack. I'm from University of Delaware. And I'm uh, Max Di Penta from uh, University of Sagno, Italy. So we're going to start by uh, kind of uh, describing who the people are and the um, reviewing process that we went through to get us here today. And then uh, Max is going to talk about all the things we learned from the data we gathered along the way through all of that process. So we started a long time ago creating a team, and um, we had area chairs and then program committee. Um, for us, our job was we first made sure that all the papers, hopefully all the papers, are within scope of um, ICSI, and then um, made sure that they conform to all of the requirements they need to conform to, did plagiarism checks, paper assignment, and then we oversee the whole process of um, reviewing. So we had 10 area chairs, and they also helped us in scoping papers, um, ensuring a, really their big role was to create consistency within all the topics so that all papers in a given topic were reviewed in a, in a fair, consistent way. Um, and then they overseed all the discussion and finally made the final calls. Um, and then the program committee did all the work of the actual reviewing of the papers. They also did some lightweight artichoke fec uh, checking, and then finally uh, lots of discussion online. So these are the things we uh, instantiated new this year beyond what's been done in previous ICSIs. So we had our, the reviewers, we had one reviewer of each paper in charge of basically just looking at the artifact to make sure that it's, it was there as, as the authors in the papers claimed that it was going to be there. Um, and then um, the, we also had area chairs selected based on the, the, the um, selected based on the author's indications. So authors themselves were choosing what area they thought something fit into and that's how we uh, assigned them towards the area chairs. And sometimes we had, we had some really crowded areas of research, and so we had multiple area chairs there. And finally, we instituted a second response phase for a very few number of papers where they really, uh, some, like an extra review came in, we thought they needed, they needed another chance at, a, at another response. Okay, so our 10 area chairs, would you please stand up to, so we could thank you for all of the work you did? You did a ton of work.
So one of the things we recognize, we were the only people that actually saw the author's name, so we made no decisions on any papers. It came from the area chairs and the, and the reviewers. And then we had 194 PC members. Could you all please stand up with the area chairs? And we have pictures of you. Oh, we also have eight rapid reviewers who should also stand up. And here's all their pictures. Maybe you can match them all. <laughs> Lots of people to review papers for a very large conference. So this was our team. I'll go on to the reviewing process. So our, um, the deadline for papers, as most of you obviously know, was September 1st, 2022. We had 798 papers submitted. And then um, by the assignment pay, uh, uh, the, by the time we got to the assignment stage, we had 16 who, uh, that were desk rejected and two that with, were withdrawn. So there were actually 780 to be reviewed. At the first response phase, after that, we had a total of 61 that were withdrawn and 19 desk rejected. And then at the notification stage, we had um, 174 that were actually accepted. Congratulations to all those authors. 509 that were rejected, 35 that went through gatekeeping before the final decision was made, um, along with the others. And then after the gatekeeping, which is the final decision, this is where we ended up, was 207 accepted papers. Okay, so the process, this is just kind of a summary of what all happened. And now we're going to do some statistics on what happened. Okay. So, uh, all this reviewing required a total of uh, uh, more than uh, 2,000 reviews, so 2,345 reviews and uh, 721 meta-reviews. Uh, putting them all together, it's like almost 2 million of words in terms of reviewing, which is 220 XE papers, more or less, so <laughs> you can almost make, well, you can actually make an XE program with all the reviews together. And uh, in terms of characters, if you use the XE font size, it's 15 <laughs> kilometers, so you can go very far from here. And yeah, on average, uh, we, well, we got a total of uh, 10,000 uh, comments, uh, which means uh, more than 13 uh, per paper. Uh, so this is uh, interesting also what we did, we, uh, we uh, captured the status of the papers, this call, everything before we opened the rebuttal and uh, discussion. And uh, uh, what happened is that, of course, well, uh, th this was expected, uh, there was no paper that started with all negative scores that was accepted, but also uh, no paper with all positive scores that was actually uh, rejected. Well, in some years, I know this has happened, but not in our case. Uh, there were uh, papers which started with a mean score that was not very high, so less than three, that ended up being a separate, or 35 of them. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, there were 16 papers that started with a uh, pretty decent score, so greater than three, but uh, ended up being rejected after the rebuttal. Uh, we also asked PC members to uh, tell us in which cases the rebuttal helped, and uh, it turns out that in some sense uh, it helped to clarify things for 121 papers, but there were also 25 papers where apparently the rebuttal made uh, things work. So uh, unless you want to really say something, sometimes it's better to say uh, quiet. This <laughs> looks to be the <laughs> lesson learned. So. Uh, we did a little bit of uh, uh, sentiment analysis. I don't know, there are many people doing uh, research on sentiment analysis in this room on the reviews. And, uh, well, I have many more data, but this is interesting about the negative sentiments in the uh, reviews. 
And uh, what you can see is that, uh, well, of course, there is a little bit less negative for the accepted papers, but not so much. So there were uh, criticism for pretty much all the papers. So there, there is a statistic, statistical significant difference, but it's just a small effort size between rejected and accepted papers. Uh, of course, on the other hand, when we go to summarize the uh, outcome of the paper, we go to the meta-reviews, well, the difference is <laughs> more evident for the negative, but, there is a but, there is a but, because if you look the positive, the positive is pretty much the same. So this means that uh, all the meta-reviews, uh, regardless of the outcome, gave some uh, sort of encouragement and they were somewhat constructive with respect to the others. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this, those are some statistics in terms of uh, papers submitted and accepted over the years, so you can see that over the past uh, five years, the number of submissions has almost double, doubled, uh, and so the number of accepted papers. And uh, uh, for the record, those are the acceptance rates. Uh, so you see that XC is starting to accept more papers, so there is more discussion that, in some sense, will help accepting more papers. So maybe this is going even more uh, with the uh, future XC with major revisions. So going to the countries that contributed to ICSI, those uh, are some statistics about the countries that submitted more papers. So you see China is really on top of that, uh, followed by uh, US and then uh, some other countries. You see uh, Germany, Canada, Australia, of course, the locals submit a lot of papers. Singapore, which is basically a town, also a lot of papers and so on. Uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> In terms of uh, uh, accepted papers, uh, you see, once again, uh, this is pretty much uh, is similar to the previous slide, so it's very consistent. Uh, you see, again, China and uh, United States are really on top. Uh, it may be also be interesting to understand uh, and to know the number of submitted uh, papers, at least by declared areas, because the authors declared their area. And this is not really surprising. Uh, there is a majority of papers uh, related to software engineering with and for AI, uh, followed by, by a more traditional topic, which is analysis and testing, and uh, followed by the others. Uh, in terms of acceptance rate for the different areas, most of them are pretty consistent with the overall acceptance rate, so between 26 and 28%. Uh, but the, you can see a lower acceptance rate for software analytics, 14%, and a pretty good acceptance re, uh, rate for dependability. It's mostly about security papers, I believe. And uh, this is more about the topics. Uh, you don't see all the topics here. If you are interested, you can ask me. Uh, those are just the top 20. There are uh, about 50 topics in our conference. And uh, once again, you see machine learning for software engineering, and a little bit down also software engineering for machine learning, which is also a very timely topic, and then some uh, more traditional topics like uh, software testing and analysis and so on. Uh, people working on the early phases of software engineering, requirement uh, uh, modeling design, won't see uh, their areas in the top 20. Uh, so this may be a problem for this community, those areas are very important. So this afternoon, uh, we are going to have a showcase panel uh, discussing uh, uh, why uh, it's becoming difficult to publish in those areas, why people from those areas are not submitting to ICSI. So if you are interested, please attend that panel. And uh, yes, those are some uh, words coming from uh, uh, the paper title. So uh, the words can clearly see where the uh, conference is uh, uh, going these days, right? A uh, lot of uh, machine learning papers. And uh, well, those, uh, this was about the technical track, but X is not just technical track. There are uh, many papers from the other track that are interesting as the technical track papers, sometimes even more interesting. And uh, uh, all the other tracks involved more than 400 people. So if you serve the, the program <laughs> committee of any ICSI track, please stand up. <laughs> Nobody? Come Four, on. Should be 402. <laughs> yeah, 400. Uh, I guess everybody <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah.
And uh, those are some uh, statistics from the other tracks. So uh, we got a lot of contribution from the journals first, so a lot of journal papers from uh, TSC, TOSM, and MC being presented here, but also from the uh, software engineering practice. Then we have demonstration, uh, software education training, uh, new idea and emerging results, uh, software engineering society, and this year for the first time, uh, since some areas are underrepresented, uh, there was a committee that invited the selected papers from some uh, conference like uh, ICSA, which is software architecture, models, is modeling, requirement engineering, and formal methods. And uh, those papers will uh, are interleaved with other papers in, uh, in the different uh, in the different tracks. Uh, so about the, uh, how the program is structured, uh, we have 66 technical sessions, uh, three keynotes. Uh, we are going to have awards. Uh, tomorrow is mainly the six soft and TCSC awards uh, with the keynote. And uh, on uh, then uh, tomorrow, uh, last session, there will be the uh, MIP and also some other uh, society Award, and on Friday before the keynote, we are going to award the distinguished paper from uh, the technical track, but also best paper from uh, some other tracks, and we are also going to recognize our distinguished reviewers and distinguished reviewers from the other tracks. So if you are one of those, please don't miss that session uh, early in the morning. I'm afraid it's after the banquet, but yes. Uh, this is something that uh, you need to do uh, to deserve the award. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, then yes, we have uh, some <laughs> session about emerging uh, topics in uh, software engineering. Also, what's the future of software engineering? Uh, two sessions dedicated to industry uh, for, uh, paper, industry uh, reports and uh, industry forum. Seven technical briefing. Then there is the ACM student research competition, the scout contest, the Rose Festival. Uh, as I said, the showcase panel. Uh, which is today, but also today after the showcase panel, there is a tunnel meeting. You can give feedback about the future of this conference, how you would like it to change, whether it's becoming too big and so on. And uh, also various community uh, meetings. Uh, so about the 66 uh, technical sessions. So that was a challenge because we had many papers around, uh, <laughs> uh, in, all the other, in, in all the tracks, so we had to arrange them. We have, I think, uh, 10 to 11 things in parallel during the conference. So uh, what we did, first of all, each session is pretty much organized and in 15 minutes slot for long papers and uh, 7.5 for, sh uh, for uh, short papers that are uh, paired so that you can mostly easily skip, uh, go from one session to the other without missing half of a paper. And also, uh, if you are really interested in a specific topic, uh, we have tried to put in sequence all the sessions related to the different topics. So analysis paper, uh, sessions are in sequence, debugging and repair, uh, repair are in uh, sequence, and so on and so forth for the other uh, topics. And uh, yeah, uh, also uh, keep in mind that there may be some inconsistency in the app, so in case of doubt, the, the program on the web is the one that really matters. So. Okay, so thank you very much, and now we would like to uh, call John again on the stage because John is going to introduce our uh, first uh, keynote speaker. Thanks. And what happens if I do next? Ah, there we go. Oh, we've got a keynote. So Sarah's the keynote today. We've got Lee Ming, we've got Paolo. So Sarah, um, I want to thank her so much, my colleague, um, Professor Sarah Pink. She's the director of our emerging tech lab at Monash. Uh, she's an anthropologist, and she's uh, the world leader in a technique called visual uh, or video ethnography. And um, it's a really interesting technique that Sarah's pioneered and that her team uh, uses to study how are future technologies um, likely to evolve? How might they impact society and organizations and individuals? Um, what might be some of the unforeseen impacts of those? Um, what might be some of the bad things we need to avoid? 
And how might we kind of, instead of letting the future ad hocly kind of carry us forward, um, take some uh, control um, of that? Now, um, Sarah's actually going off to a, a trip tomorrow, so I first of all want to thank her for coming along to Exie and give a keynote rather than packing at home. Um, but I think you'll really, um, I think you'll really enjoy um, hearing about how another discipline carries out its research, um, uh, describes its research to the community, and thinks about how um, the future of society will be impacted, um, particularly by, by software. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, John, and um, thank you everyone for coming to listen to me today. It's a great honour to be speaking to people from a very different discipline to the discipline that I was trained in as an academic, and I'm really pleased to be able to share my work with you today. Now I have to work out how to use the clicker. <laughs> I want to start, though, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet today and also upon which we carry out much of the research I'm going to speak about today at Monash. Green bar. Yeah, I've got it, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the Wurundjeri and Burung people of the Kulin Nation, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that these lands remain unceded and always were and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, my interest as, um, I, I should first say that I've trained as an anthropologist and as an anthropological filmmaker, and since then I've worked across many different disciplines, actually, but always keep my um, basis of my work in anthropology. Um, much of my work around now is around design and futures anthropology and using the video ethnography techniques that John mentioned, which have been at the core of my practice ever since I trained as an anthropological filmmaker over 30 years ago. Now, I've called this um, talk Future Software for Life in Trusted Futures, and I'm not going to be telling you about how to um, develop software for life in trusted futures. I want to talk to you about the future context and situation and people and environments that we might likely be working in and how we go about investigating those situations, how we investigate life in the present and how we seek to investigate life in the future. At the core of my work is this question of how will people, other species, software, hardware, live together in as yet unknown futures? How can we work towards trusted futures and safe futures, where human values and the environment are supported by emerging technologies? So I'm trying to get away from the idea that technologies will shape and drive and influence and make our futures better, that, that technologies can solve futures and that that technologies can solve societal problems. I think it's people who solve those, those problems. It's people who take us forward. And the question is, how can tech play a role in that? How it can enable us to live better and to survive going forward in the future, in a moment in time where we have a global um, health crisis, where we have a climate crisis and a geopolitical crisis? Now, but turning to, to software, where does software engineering, design and development usually happen? It's one of the questions. And, and how and when do software engineers engage with the people whose lives that software will actually become part of? Now, I'd also just say that in the social sciences, as design anthropology anyway, we don't really like the term user. Um, so I use the term end user a bit um, provocatively in a way, because for us, people aren't users. People aren't users, people aren't just users, they aren't just citizens, they're not just publics. People are complex um, entities who live contingent lives in very complicated circumstances. People are never just users. As a user, whatever you do is shaped by so many other things. Now, thinking a little bit about where software engineers work, and you all know the answer to that question much better than I do, but. In two projects we've undertaken in an emerging technologies lab, one in, in collaboration with John Grundy's Humanised Lab here in Australia and another in collaboration with a group I work with at Halmstad University in computer science in Sweden, we've actually shown that what we found is that while anthropologists focus on the relationships that people develop with technologies in the real world, in everyday life, 
Actually, um, most of the software engineers and data scientists that we interviewed worked from home or worked in offices or labs. Um, and also they focused more, more directly on their relationships with their clients or their customers rather than with who were seen as end users, that is real people in the real world. Those real people who would actually be experiencing and interacting with software on an everyday basis. Now, of course, I, I do acknowledge and know that there exists some significant practices of developing software for social good, which involve software specialists and social researchers engaging with communities, the communities that people live in and designing with and for them. So I'm not denying that that work happens at all. And I know that there are some great examples, um, and potentially I imagine that some people in this room who, who are software engineers have engaged with rural communities and, and people to develop software with them. Um, and I don't want to diminish the importance of that work or to diminish the importance of the work that John Grundy and the Humanised Lab are doing here, which is really trying to bring relevant understandings of people, of humans, to software engineering. What I want to do instead is to really raise what for me is a design and futures anthropologist to some of the key issues and some of the ways forward. I'm really interested in this question of what we really need to do to bring social and computing sciences together to create pathways to ethical and trusted futures. Now one of the problems with the social sciences is that most social sciences start with the critique. And um, when most social scientists engage with, with STEM, with the science and technology and engineering um, disciplines, we usually start by saying what we think is wrong. Um, then we think about it a little bit more and find out a little bit more what, what people are really doing in those disciplines and what they really want, and we stop being quite as critical and we try to collaborate. Um, but of course, that's not really a productive way forward. And so for me, my agenda is a bit different. My agenda is actually to, re to try to reshape the social sciences and to invite people from other disciplines to reshape their disciplines so that we can be absolutely open to each other, um, so that we can work together. And in the context of my current work, my aim is for us to do that, so that social scientists can work better with engineering and computer sciences and economists and people from other disciplines to better foresight, forecast, and plan for better futures. And in doing so, I hope that we can constitute much more powerful interdisciplinary approaches to understanding and designing technology for and with possible futures. But in doing so, I really want to insist, though, that a lot of care needs to be taken not to repeat some of the mistakes that have been part of the research traditions of social sciences in the past. So to create a more human and socially and community-focused approach to software engineering, we don't just need to bring the existing social sciences to software engineering. We don't just need to open ourselves up to interdisciplinary work. We really need to reshape both fields to work together, if that's what we want to achieve. Now, and I think there's some important things just to note, and I won't dwell on them too much, but the first thing I want to say is please don't depend on unreliable statistics when seeking to understand what future human life might be like. Quantitative research, of course, and I've, I found the statistics about the conference to be absolutely fascinating because, of course, a qualitative social science conference would never have the capacity to even <laughs> understand you know, our, our papers and our submissions and our selections on that basis. It was amazing. Um, and quantitative research can be very important for assessing, for example, economic futures as well. But surveys actually tell us very little about human experience and values. And I am concerned when I see influential foresight work done in Australia, which makes some very unfortunately unrealistic assumptions about future trends based on unreliable statistics. Statist I'm not saying that the statistics aren't unreliable in themselves, but they're unreliable for the comments that are assumed about them on, based on about human experience. I'm also concerned about how some approaches in the social sciences and in design actually objectify um, future humans and present them as personas, as aggregated personas. I know personas can be very useful in, in work which tries to consider what people do, but I would like to warn against the idea of actually assuming that they represent what real people are like at all, because they're not real people. They're aggregated, objectified versions of people. Um, for anthropologists, that's problematic because we think that the objectification of anything is actually unethical and wrong. And the third thing I want to mention is that there has been a... The philosophy of ethics has really dominated as well. I often find that um, 
in work around artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence and automated decision making. The idea of is to how do we learn about ethics? Oh, we get a philosopher, we ask a philosopher. Now, philosophy has done some great work about ethics, but actually, um, philosophy doesn't account for how people really make ethical decisions in real everyday life. Um, at that moment, where they have to make a decision, and it doesn't account for the contingent circumstances that come into play, or with how people imagine their futures. Philosophy actually tends to extrapolate ethics into a set of logics which then become debated as abstract possibilities. The trolley problem is, a, is an example, and I won't go into what's wrong with that, because it will take me a long time. But it's nothing to do with anything that could ever happen in real, everyday life. So the limit, then, of, of working with some of these disciplines, it's not that they don't bring benefits, but I want to, to highlight the limitations. As I said, anthropologists are very critical. Um, because none of those disciplines pay real attention to every life as, everyday life as it's lived. As John said when he introduced me, that's what our work is about. Those real everyday circumstances, those possible futures. Um, how will software become really entangled in complicated and complex ways in real lives as they're lived? How will the way it's used actually be impacted by those decisions that people make in the moment according to their own values and their own priorities, according to what they trust and what they believe in at that moment? And our research shows that what people trust, what people believe in, and the kinds of decisions people make are not consistent. Of course, there are principles, but as circumstances change from moment to moment, people might make very different decisions about how they feel about a particular technology and what they'll do with it. Now, I want to give another example, still being critical, though, of, of what some of the, the problems can be. Now, this is a very um, dominant and influential um, organisation, really. That AI for people, is the, it calls itself and I'm quoting, the first European forum bringing together the key stakeholders as academia, industry, civil society organisations and the European Parliament to lay the foundations for a good AI society, shaping the impact of artificial intelligence. Now, of course, this is worthy work and it's important. It seeks to, um, as it says, it's committed to the development of AI technology in a way that secures people's trust, serves the public interest and strengthen shared social responsibility. It's authored by a very influential group of scholars and industry, computers, uh, industry contributors who specialise in ethics from the fields of philosophy, law and computer sciences, but it excludes the social sciences such as anthropology and qualitative sociology completely. Um, the problem with the way that these concepts, things that are really part of our everyday lives, trust, public interest, and um, shared social responsibility. You can't really secure trust by making particular developments in AI technology. Trust, as I said, is something that happens in everyday life and it's very contingent. Um, the idea of the public interest is not about people. The public is an abstract concept. It's got nothing to do with how we live our lives and who we are. And the idea of social responsibility, well, again, when it's abstracted from those very moments in which people take responsibility for what they do, again, is abstract. So this AI um, for people agenda is actually inhabited by a striking absence of the experience and the activity of actual people. And look at all of those white men in the photo, in the banner. I'm sure they're doing a great job at representing us all, because they look very different from the real people who participate in our researchers, and they inhabit very different spaces from them. So what does it mean then to engage with real people in everyday lives and with their experiences? How can we consider their possible futures? Well, what we do in my lab and what anthropologists more widely do is to engage with real people and communities in the sites where they actually live, in their homes, in their communities, in their towns, in their cities, um, the places where they sense, where they feel, where they breathe, and where they do everything else that we, they need to do 
to ensure that the flow of everyday life continues. And that's what we've been working on for many years now. So how do we do this? We go there, <laughs> as you can see. Um, the first principle is to get into people's lives and worlds with them. Immerse yourself there. Understand what's important to them. So I want to now start with a, a video clip from the um, documentary Smart Home, some seniors. And it's, again, an example of um, who we work with, where do we start? We don't start with you know, wealthy white men sitting on a panel in the European Union. We start with the people who are not usually included in mainstream tech design and development. This example is with seniors, of course. Other examples are with other groups of people. So if we could just play that clip now. Always say please when you talk to Google. No, I do. I yes. only have a minute. There are still many unanswered questions about how and where digital home technologies really fit into older people's lives. It's a bit daunting. For someone of my age, when you've got all this new technology, I haven't been brought up with. This film joins a group of older people on their six-month journey of living with smart home technologies in 2020. Our research team met with them in their homes in regional Australia. You do need bright lighting in, the, in your bathroom at our age because you can't afford to have anything on the floor because you're easily tripped over. Everywhere, it's not marking out anywhere, you know. One day I said, Hey Google, turn the kettle and turn the jug on. Nothing happened. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> Edna and Bob, Hilda and Owen, Beryl and David, Robert, Helen and Ken, John and Shirley showed us where smart home technologies brought new value and joy into their lives, where they became frustrated with them, where they needed support. And when they were concerned about the cost of internet access, electricity and technologies, if they're accompanied by the right social values, ethics, usability interfaces and services, smart technologies can support older generations to stay safe, independent and actively participating as our world rapidly changes. All of our films are actually now fully available in full form. This is the trailer um, in, on our um, Emerging Technologies Lab website if people want to follow up and see more. So what I want to do now is to talk you through um, a couple of examples of situations and research projects that we've done um, where we are really starting to develop this um, foresight and understanding of futures and work towards futures in, in a couple of different ways. In each example, I'd like you to think about if they're useful, a series of questions to ask yourselves, where is software needed? What should it do? Who should be in control of it? And where and with whom should it be designed? There may be other questions you want to ask yourself as well, and I think it, I'd be also interested to see what comes, up to, comes to your minds later as, uh, as well. So... Um, this project, Digital Energy Futures, is a four-year project. It's funded by the Australian Research Council and undertaken as a linkage project, which means it has industry partners. It's undertaken with Energy Consumers Australia, Osgrid and Osnet here. And in this project, we were seeking to develop a new methodology for forecasting residential electricity demand, but through social, qualitative social research predominantly. Our project had a series of stages. Um, over the four years, we analysed industry visions and trends and scenarios for future tech and future energy. Then we did a household ethnography, which I'll show you a clip from in a minute, which actually demonstrated that most of those um, industry um, visions, trends and scenarios for future tech and future energy for people in their households were actually implausible. Um, we worked with um, Energy Consumers Australia to do an energy consumer behaviour survey. We looked at demand management opportunities and reported on those. But we also did a series of futures workshops with households to understand how they expected their futures to be. And we also developed a series of forecasting scenarios. Now, we'll first just go straight into the next video to show you, give you some insights into how we did that work, the people we worked with them, and what it was like to be with them in their homes. So could you put the next video clip on? Imagine a future life where your smartphone, watch, AirPods, and your electric car were automatically charged without you even knowing. What would it be like to give up control to an external system which optimizes your energy use, decides when a robotic vacuum cleans your home, 
and even when your electricity is available? Well, are these even realistic or desirable futures? The Digital Energy Futures Project generates new insights about emerging digital and energy trends by investigating people's real lives and possible futures. My daughter has one of these. She has a Google one. She's in the car and she just says, Google, take me home. Hey Google, could you set me a timer called Champagne for 30 minutes? Okay, a 30 minute timer called Champagne. And we're starting now. What's the champagne for? Well, I want to have a drink and... <laughs> <laughs> The visions of personalised energy and technology futures shaped to the desires of the individual are distant from the personal and family lives of the 72 households who participated in our project. What people really do in the present and the ways they imagine their own futures indicate that automated, personalised individual services are not always welcome. Automation is not for me because I think it takes choice away. And I'm a control freak, so I like to have control over my environment, so... But if you were offered the, the possibility, though, of having an automated system which would actually optimise your energy use and decide when all of these things were going to work, could that possibly work for you, then? Um, I... It's yes, possibly. absolutely. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> However, I do need override, but we will not allow for remote control <laughs> unless it is imposed by government. <laughs> People creatively tailor their technology use to suit their everyday lives. So to gain the benefits automation offers to the energy sector, we need to align it with their human futures. I found with this mum, she needs something on the phone, they have to use the translation services. I mean, those AI can be developed, then that can, you know, can be replaced. So having automation, to me, is restricting what you can do. And I think technology should expand what you can do. So one, what, one of the findings from this research project, one of the findings as you saw from the video was that people were not really ready to sign up to automated systems. Um, even the people who said yes um, wanted an override button. Um, people want to stay in control as they move in, into futures. And one of the key things we found is one of the, the uh, important findings around that was that also, people want to stay in control because they want to be able to care for themselves. They want to be able to care for their families. They want to be able to keep their families safe moving forward. And they don't trust automated systems, automated control of their energy by external organisations or government or, or energy companies to do that. One of the questions that was fundamental around that was the question of clean and safe air. So here in Australia, with the pandemic, um, with the bushfires, with the asthma thunderstorms, um, and with just living at home more and being more exposed to indoor allergens, the rise of air technology, air purification and um, filtration technology is, is really visible. So the market for this tech is growing and growing. Um, which provided us, along with others, this is an example, other, other insights, into really interesting questions that we needed to ask then about people about how they m imagined the future technologies that they would use. And um, so as part of our work then, we had a series of three future, a series of futures workshops that explored three themes. One was around the future of air tech in homes, one was around the future of electric vehicles, and the other was around the future of future life in extreme weather in 2050. Um, and so this is how we did the workshops. These were actually conducted online, and we, we used interesting methods, which is one of the things I want to tell you about. We, um, we created the workshops online partly because of the pandemic, but also because using Miro board, they gave us a great opportunity to ask people to do quite inventive things. So to find out how people imagined their future home air tech, we asked them to, to invent a new technology. 
Most people invented a technology that did air conditioning, heating, purification, filtration, dehumidification, and also helped to remove um, particles from mould and all of those kinds of things. So people, and, and potentially would also remove from, you know, COVID viruses and that kind of stuff too. So people um, tended to invent these new technologies that they saw themselves as potentially using in the future. But then we asked them to do some role playing with us. So we actually asked them to be the technology and we interviewed them pretending to be the electricity grid. Now, the reason for doing this is because we wanted people to humanise the technology. We wanted them to put their own human values in it. So they would tell us, what would the technology do? How would it work? How would you be controlled by your family? How would you protect your family if you were the technology? What would your family think if you wanted to do this? Would you share the data? How would you ensure privacy? And that method was so fruitful because we were actually able to put those human values and perspective into the technology that they imagined. And based on that work, not just around the air tech, but also around the EV futures we asked them to imagine, and also around the future extreme weather conditions and living life in extreme weather, we developed a series of foresights. We have a report from our stage four of our project called Foresights for Future Living, which is available on our website. And I'm not going to go through all of the findings, but what I want to, to highlight is that what this research enabled us to see was a whole new way of understanding and conceptualizing what people will do in the future. So we don't just take at face value what people say they would like the future to be like or how they imagine the future. We take those understandings of possible futures and we analyze them. Then we turn them into foresights. And we use those foresights to enable us to actually reframe the dominant assumptions from the industry, which we had found in our first set of reports. Um, to reframe the way in which we understand and see the future. So what we wanted to argue then from our work then is that futures need to be people-led, futures need to be collaborative, and futures need to be tailored. And, and in doing so, we challenge some of the concepts which are very dominant. So for example, the idea of early adopters, we challenged, to, to, and we changed that concept to the idea of everyday innovators to really represent what people do. Let me show you some of our reframing concepts and the way we visualised them. So you'll have seen this one quite often, actually, but this reframing concept was about saying, well, actually, we know from our work that in the future, people are actually not necessarily, don't need to necessarily have their energy automated because people will be resourceful and generous. People will share energy with others. People will donate their energy to a hospital in a moment of crisis where there isn't enough energy to go around. So let's start thinking about the impact that those human values will have on future and on the way that we need technology to work in the future. Another one of our reframing concepts was the idea of set and notify. There's a dominant concept in the industry which is set and forget. The idea is that people want to set things and then just forget about them so they can happen automatically because it will be more convenient. But people didn't want that. Um, people want, want to set things and then they want notifications so they can make their own decisions about how to act in moments of crisis or in everyday moments where they might change their, there might be ways in which they can benefit from using their energy in a different way. Um, so people want to be notified when there's bushfire smoke so they can close their windows. They want to be notified so they can decide when they want to hang their laundry out. Everyday life is very mundane. It has lots of small actions and lots of small decisions. People organise them, those themselves and people are very proud of the way in which they have organised their lives. And they do not necessarily want external intervention in that. They want to continue to organise their lives themselves, to innovate themselves, to make their own systems better. And the final um, reframing concept I wanted to show you was this idea of everyday innovators not necessarily early adopters. And this visualisation um, was really about how people might want to just organise the way they do their things themselves and set up their own system. So rather than having a whole automated system, this guy is actually cleaning his home himself and then he's thinking about, you know, when, when um, the song that he's listening to ends, then he'll pop out to the garage and start charging the car with his home battery, 
Right. So he's kind of organized things in a way that's actually very sustainable in terms of energy, and he's using renewable energy sources, but he is the person who's directing and orchestrating the way that it works. So with all those in mind, and we had a whole series of other reframing concepts, um, I want to take you on to our scenarios for future living. Now, the scenarios for future living were 2030 and 2050. There were four scenarios. Um, I won't go through them in detail because they're all in the report. Um, what I want to do is to take you a little bit further into one of these um, scenarios. It's called sunrises and, and, and siestas. Because it's where we ask you to imagine a future where society adapts to a changing climate and, a, and an energy system. Um, but the point is it's, it's people-led. It's, it's society adapts. Society isn't adapted by technology. And what we see is that extreme weather events are happening. So society shifts to adapt to it. And, and in response to the way that people are living in this context then, new infrastructure comes in. So we can see that people start living different household routines. People start doing things at different times of the day, depending on when it's too hot to actually do the things you would normally have done in the past at those times of day. Infrastructure is around. There are domes that people can go outdoors under. Um, people work at different times of the day. Kids go to school at different times of the day. And there's a strong focus on community, uh, as well as on renewable energy. We look a little bit more detail and some of these things that happen and we can see how people are living differently with their animals. Um, people are caring for others differently. Um, hospitals are running slightly differently. There's, a, there's more of a community focus there. So these scenarios for the future then, the question becomes, well, what technology, what software, what hardware do we need to ensure that these futures work and support the adaptation of society? rather than asking how can technology shape and create new futures that people will have to adapt to afterwards, because that's where it goes wrong, because people don't necessarily adapt or do what they're meant to do. Right, I'll now just move on to one more project I wanted to talk to you about. This is a different project as regards futures. We weren't predicting far futures. We were working with near and immediate futures in this project. This is a project we did with City of Melbourne, um, in Argyle Square, which is um, just a little bit on the other side of the river, a bit up into the north of the city, if you have a chance to visit. Um, the project was called City Sensing Data Futures, and it's a project where we had an opportunity to develop a values-based approach to ethical city data. Now, this is a shorter project than the other one, but it involved a whole series of stages, which involved getting there into the real world with people, developing an analysis and principles and concepts, in this case, designing a prototype, and then asking people to engage the prototype, and then working on a future iteration and a design proposal. So again, here we were in the real world with real people. Um, we wanted to understand how people experienced Argyle Square, which had had a series of sensors installed. So the sensors were in different groups, and there were environmental sensors sensing air quality, um, and soil and humidity. There were sensors that um, were counting how many times people used the bins, how many times people used the toilets. There were sensors that counted how many times, how many people crossed the square and walked through it. There was a bench sensor, bench sensor which counted how many people sat on it. Um, so there were a whole range of different sensors, and um, we wanted to understand how people experienced them, how people felt about them, how people felt about their data being collected, what they thought was happening to the data, what, obviously what fears and anxieties and concerns they had, how they felt about the organisations that were collecting their data and where they, if they, what they thought they were doing with the data. Um, so we really got in there and we also developed and, and spoke to people, listened to people, asked people questions, but again, developed an experimental technique which actually inspired the technique I told you about from the other project, because this project came first. This is a technique called, if you were a sensor. So we asked the participants to role play one of the sensors in the park and um, to tell us, what data would you collect if you were a sensor? What would you do with that data? Who would you share it with? How would you protect the privacy of people in the park? What would you allow people to do with that data? How would you want that data? How would you give that data back to the citizens, to the community, to the real people who use that park? So again, we wanted to humanize the technology 
and what the technology would do with the data, how it would control it, how it would collect it, how it would store it, how it would share it. So by asking people to, play, to do that role play, we enabled them to put their values into the way they imagined future sensor technologies for the park. Now again, we analysed the materials, um, and on the basis of what we found, pe what the people's feelings were about sensors and data and sharing and the organisations and institutions that were involved, we realised that we needed to create a way of communicating about the data and obviously thinking about how it would be controlled and how it would be used that felt close to people, that felt familiar, that felt community-focused. And based on that, we developed a family of sensors. And we represented that digitally on the website that was accessible through QR code, but we also represented it physically by creating a series of prototype sculptures which were designed to communicate about the presence of the sensors, which weren't obviously visible always, and to communicate about what they did and um, what their implications were and possibilities were for the people who used the park. So once we'd done that and produced those objects, we then, we then actually trialled them in a public prototype experiment in collaboration with our City of Melbourne partners who did a tour of the park with, with people who came to participate. And um, we asked people to engage with the sculptures, to engage with the, um, the digital sensor information they could connect to. We asked people to tell us how they felt about it. We asked them to write on the sculptures to get that really close, tangible connection. And um, we, we went into quite a lot of depth to understand what kind of communication and what kind of interaction and what kind of relationship and limitations that people and requirements people would have for future city data sensing. What would they want the technology to do and how would they, what they want the data to do and how would they want to access and use the data themselves and then what would they allow the city to do with that data. Um, on the basis of that, then, of course, we did another analysis and um, we developed um, a data futures design proposal for the city of Melbourne, a set of permanent sculptural objects. And we also visualised how they might look and how they might work and what kind of different possible shapes and iterations of them might exist in the city. Um, and the idea is that people would be using them to access and engage with and interact with knowledge about their city through that which was collected by the sensors. We also developed a set of implications for city data sensing because our work was not just about the work we did for the city of Melbourne. We developed a transferable and scalable methodology for ethical values-based use of sensor technologies in cities, which could be transferable and scalable across other cities and other countries. And um, the implications then for us were the question of, well, and our, the first ones are the most significant. I just mentioned a couple of them, that the design of trusted city data sensing involves attention to everyday ethics, values, practices, and environment. And those are the things you can only understand by getting there into real life with people and learning with them in the sites where they live. We also emphasised that we needed to align city, public and everyday values in city data sensing. And by city values, we were very lucky working with the city of Melbourne, we worked with their emerging technologies team, who are so ethical, they're so values-based that their values and our values as a research team, because of course as social scientists, we bring certain values and ethics and principles which we believe need to be part of the way that technology is used in our, our lives and our cities and everywhere in the future. And also they're the values of the people who were involved. So aligning those values is so important. And I, I believe that's also a mode of alignment that should be part of the future work of software engineers as well. Um, and we wanted to create these direct lines of acknowledgement and accountability to local values, environments and practices when designing city data sensing. So I won't go into more of those implications, but just to emphasise, those kind of top ones are so important because they're about values and ethics and they're about ensuring that organisations and people and researchers are all on the same page. We all have the same values and ethics. We can align them and bring together and work together in very profitable ways. And I think the same goes in terms of aligning values, of course. The same goes for how we think about um, the future of... Um, how we go about thinking about the, the future of interdisciplinary collaboration. So the question for me is how can we get to a situation where it's this, 
where we've got this resourcefulness amongst researchers and amongst institutions and amongst people across disciplines and across those stakeholder groups. That community spirit, that generosity, that inventiveness, that innovation, and the ethics and the trust and the values. So how can we go to a situation where it's this? And it's not this. So let's think a little bit more about how we create those communities, shared values between those people who design software and the people who use it and the communities it becomes part of. And it's not just a row of white men sitting there in European Parliament making decisions about what the ethics should be and what should happen. Of course, we need regulation and we need all those institutional um, movements to, to happen as well, but we need to really um, be there doing the work with communities. And we need to do it not only in the present, but we also need to do it for possible futures. Now, to end then, I want to just bring to the, the fore again this point about that my work really does involve creating a new movement in the social sciences which opens it up to collaboration with other disciplines, invites other disciplines to work with us in seeking to understand how we might better foresight, forecast and do good in futures that have not yet come about. We need to ask how to design for futures with human and environmental values and priorities at the centre. And I think that any of this work that we do, interdisciplinary foresight and forecasting research, it needs to be understand, done to understand future worlds, but also it needs to be done in the context of thinking about future software, so that software that is engineered today can be future ready. And that's what's so important. We need to have the knowledge that we can work with to ensure that we're not just designing and creating things for now and for tomorrow, but also that they're ready for us to move on into those futures and to understand what those futures could potentially be like, not just from a quantitative and predictive perspective, but to understand how people will mess up those quantitative futures, what people are really likely to do and how we can account for that. Um, So let's think about how we move forward into those futures of those values and priorities at the centre and to ensure that because software engineering is essential to our futures and if we want the right software to be created for futures that are human environment and environmentally sustainable, then we've got to account then um, for people and to account realistically and plausibly and ethically for future human life. So I'll leave you with that thought. I think I'm, John showed me the five minutes, so I think I'm just about in time. But a couple more things before I finish, because I've talked about a lot of work that's been done, and I'm not doing that work alone, of course. In the Emerging Technologies Lab, we have an amazing group of researchers, so social scientists coming from sociology, anthropology, human geography, human computer interaction. And we also have colleagues who come from different areas of design, co-design, participatory design, and industrial design. Um, this is, and we also work with teams from other universities and the Smart Homes and Seniors Project. We work with McLean Care, which is a not-for-profit not aged care provider. And we worked with a tech team from Deakin University. In City Sensing Data Futures, a whole team of us work together from ET Lab and with our City of Melbourne partners. And in Digital Energy Futures, we've had a very big team working together over four years, um, coming from anthropology, sociology, and design, and as well, of course, with our partners from Energy Consumers Australia, Osgrid and Osnet. So many thanks to all of my colleagues. This is certainly not just my own work. We're a big team working towards what I hope will be um, Trusted Futures. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, Sarah. Um, great talk, thank you. Um, so I want to just tease out um, how we do this. So we all, I think we would all agree we want more human values in software. We want to satisfy 
people's needs. Um, there's a common refrain that the, the way to do that is to bring more disciplines. Um, you referred to a version of that, which is if you want to handle ethics, just bring in the philosophers in. I agree, that's not the right answer. Mm. I think you are kind of saying the answer might be bring in anthropologists. But to what extent, I, I've been arguing that the answer might be that, but it's, it's also um, changing the way we educate software engineers. I mean, software mm. engineers currently get very little exposure to things like ethics. Maybe they take one course in an undergraduate degree and then they forget it all. So the question is, to what extent is the answer building multidisciplinary teams or, or is the answer actually retrain, changing the way that we train software engineers? I think it's both. Um, because the more we train not only software engineers but also social scientists to understand enough of each other's disciplines and to be able to work together, that's how we will be able to move forward to create better interdisciplinary teams. Um, because I, I trained in two fields. I trained as a documentary filmmaker and I trained as an anthropologist. I spent most of my career working as, anth as an anthropologist who's used some documentary techniques in my work, and I'm now making more documentaries, but nobody who trained in the master's degree that I did to do both has ever done both. I think it's very difficult to, it's easy to be able to engage with something from another discipline and be able to really understand what happens in it, but I think it's difficult to be able to, for one academic to do it all and bring it all together. It's difficult to keep up with all the debates, it's difficult to, under, to engage, I wouldn't say understand, but to engage and continue to engage with ev the evolution of the theory. So I think to train a software engineer in ethics is important, but for the software engineer ultimately to work with an anthropologist or another scholar of, of ethics who really understands how the, the theories of ethics, how our understandings of ethics uh, are evolving and bringing that, because in the social sciences, especially in the empirical social sciences that I work in, we have an ongoing dialogue between theory and empirical work. We're always moving our theory on, we're always learning more knowledge through our empirical work. So I think, it's, I think it would be hard to create a career path that did all of that. So I think, but you're right, both things. Good morning, my name is Alicia Boyd. Um, I, have, I enjoyed your presentation. I have a social science background and also in medicine and so in the social sciences and then also working in software engineering space. So I'm kind of a unicorn in this um, field. Um, my question is, I, I like how you center community and moving to the margins and allowing them to have control. It's a power dynamic that's there. Um, my question for you, as you're working in this space, how does the research change you and your position of power and privilege to not impart your values onto the community, but allow them to guide the, de the decision making, the values, what is good for them? Thank you. Yes, for us, it's, it's always, always been about engaging with people in those, as I said in the talk, those people in those real sites where they live and, and understanding their values. Um, as an anthropologist, that's our role. Um, it's not about imposing our own values on people and communities. And I suppose when I talked about the values of the research team, the values of the research team are very, it's very much more about a set of principles, which is very much concerned with surfacing other people's values and engaging with them and, and prioritizing them. So I think, but you know, again, um, it's always, it can always be contentious because you may be working in an environment where values are contested between the different people there. You might work in two communities who have very different values. And some of those values might be values that you find personally to be problematic, ethically and politically. So. Um, but I think you're very much talking about when we're working with communities who haven't usually been listened to and how we surface their voices, and that's really always been fundamental to what we do. And, and film, of course, is an important tool for doing that, for actually bringing people, enabling people to be present in a, a way that hopefully can invoke empathetic and um, deeper 
understanding from the perspective of an audience as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk, Paola and Berardi. Um, actually, I, I'm not sure I, I really got your point, but <laughs> just so, so I beg your pardon if I didn't. But um, so it, you seem to, to refer to people like a collective uniform a noun, but, but it's not uniform, no. I mean, in, in your study, you are an anthropologist, you know that, in your studies you, you show you have shown out segments of, of the people, mm -hmm. and this segment might react very differently, may have different values. May, so, so, I mean, I think that this is a big issue. If you would have interviewed Z generation or beyond Z generation, you might have got completely different answer mm. um, regarding control, for example. And as a matter of fact, these generations, the new generation, have been shaped by technology. And this is a big issue that, uh, um, and here now I defend a little bit the, the uh, AI for people initiative, because, because in order to, to, to do what you do, I mean, to put in pace the speed of technology and the change that it induces, and our ability to really keep up with what people want, we need rules, we need the regulation, we need to set up value that holds for everybody. So to some extent, a, a top-down um, issue has to be solved. So I just wanted to, yeah. to comment about this. It's not, it's not a superiority of one discipline over the other. I think that we need both, and yes, we need and urgently I, yeah. both. And I did say that we need both, that we need regulation, but we do need to change a situation where we have developed the tech then think about the ethics, then regulate it. There needs to be something that comes before. There's a lot of research being done in the world about people. Different, and when I say people, the whole concept of people is that people are diverse, extremely diverse. And there is an enormous amount of research being done about research with people of all different, all different generations and all over the world in, in different situations. But that research remains invisible. Um, now, I'll give you, I guess, another, another good example. Um, the um, for anthropologists, for example, you know, some of the things like the, the documentaries, um, the tech bro documentaries, where you've got all the guys you know, um, being interviewed about what went wrong in Silicon Valley and how social media is terrible suddenly. And then, of course, there were many women scholars who for a very long time have made some very similar points, but it's not real until they say it. So what I'm saying, that there's a lot of research, there's a lot of knowledge, there's been a lot of listening already to many communities all over the world, but that research is not being foregrounded. And for me, that's the problem. So it's not about one discipline being better than others, it's actually about the need to engage much, much more with this kind of work. And more and more, more, and more attention is being paid to it, it's being increasingly acknowledged, but I think for me the very important thing is to actually think about it in terms of how we imagine possible futures, because at the moment we've got such a growing capacity to use predictive analytics to look at futures quantitatively. Um, but what will we really learn about those futures that's of value if we can't align that with qualitative research about futures that enables us to understand how people will really live in futures? So um, for me it's, it's about putting that jigsaw together in a really great way. And of course, you always exaggerate when you're trying to make a convincing argument. <laughs> Thank you for the talk, Waris Arawi. Um, I have a question um, about, I like the idea of involving people before doing things. Uh, mm. But from my experience, there are two phenomena that uh, usually we have to deal with. The first one is the, the fear of change, the fear of unknown that make people just say no from the beginning. Uh, the, the other phenomenon, when most of us interact with industry, uh, and usually when we talk with them, they have the feeling that the issue they are facing are unavoid, unavoidable. I mean, uh, they cannot, we cannot solve that. This is like, this is how it works, and we always did this thing the same way. So how do you deal with this, like, uh, uh, feelings or, uh, or fear of the changes? Well, I guess 
Again, it's about changing the way that, that we work rather than trying to impose change on people to, be, to get people engaged and involved in change process. And I mean, it's very easy to say that. It's much more complicated in practice. But, um, and, and again, enable people to feel that they are in control of change processes. And I think that's what very much came from our digital energy futures work, is that people wanted automation to be able to work for them. People weren't necessarily against automation in principle, even though some of them you know, found it... Um, but but they, they drew the line. And, and many of them didn't trust organisations and institutions to make changes for them. So some of it is about being sensitive to negotiating those layers of change and, and how they can happen and, and where they can happen. But, but making change happen with massive groups of people is, is, of course, very hard. And I don't really have the answer about how to do it on a massive scale. Hi. Um, could you talk a bit about the difficulty of scaling and generalizing smaller scale anthropological studies and how this may lead to erasure? Yes, and that's... It's, for me, it's around that question, that relationship between the particular and the, and the general, right? The specific and the general. And, of course, that's what anthropo anthropologists deal with all the time. So, in this kind of work, when we, the point is not... We find out about the specific, but then we work the specific to create principles and concepts and, and wider understandings. Now, for, now and for many anthropologists, the universal is a deep problem, and, and many anthropologists actually reject that we could do anything at a universal level, or we should even have universal theories in anthropology. I disagree, because I think they can be useful, but you've always got to be aware that they could also be problematic. Um, so, I think, for example, when I've spoken about ethics and I've spoken about trust, what I've found in a lot of my research is that trust is something that emerged, that is not something you can get from somebody and put in a technology, right? You can't make people trust technologies by designing technologies in such a way that people will trust them. But instead, you have to understand trust as something that emerges in everyday life, in everyday circumstances. It's about the people that are around you. It's about the material world that you're in. It might even be about the weather. Um, it's, about, it's a feeling. And that you can generalise across different, different societies. It will manifest differently in different situations and according to different cultures and different values and different principles, different ways of being. But that's the kind of thing that you can say is transferable. And if you understand trust in a different way to the dominant mode of um, understanding trust in the computer sciences, <laughs> um, you understand it in that everyday way and understand that that's probably the way you need to think about trust, whoever you're designing for, then that's the way in which an anth anthropological principle and concept can actually be transferable globally. Not s and it, that's not to say it will work perfectly in every situation, but it gives you a guide in relation to what your starting point could be. Daniela Damien, University of Victoria. Thank you so much for such an inspiring talk about the future of technologies. I really like the statement from one of your um, end users of smart technologies that said that technologies of the future should not be constraining but expanding what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to push a little bit into the discussion of and got, get, get your thoughts on how can we concretely start that in our, our education environments? How do we teach our future software engineers who build these tools? when we teach them coding and, you know, yes, insightful design methods, but how do we teach them that empathy and methods to talk to the end users and understand? So really anthropological mm. methods into our classes. Is that yeah. possible? It's possible. And, you know, like um, a, a short... A unit which teaches ethnographic methods. I've taught in my the past, in my, in my career, I've taught ethnographic methods many, many times. You know, it would be like a semester course with social science students who've never done anything like that before. And it's about learning a few simple techniques to be able to immerse yourself in other people's lives, to, to observe, to take notes, to understand, um, and to engage with people in those circumstances. I would re just recommend that you send your students to um, a year one or year two anthropology participant observation class. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Or get some anthropologists in your faculty, because all computer science faculties need anthropologists. Please join me in thanking Sarah again for a